Okay, this is going to be fairly short. I just want to check in with what's happening with illuminated manuscripts during the Gothic period. So we talked about them um, quite a bit in our early medieval discussions and also in um, the Romanesque some. So I want to just check in during the Gothic and kind of give you a little update on what's going on in the world of books. So here we go. Um, so there's a guy named Dante. Uh, he writes the Divine Comedy in 1310. And in it, he refers to Paris as the city famous for the art of illumination, okay? Um, and he's not wrong, okay? Uh, during the Gothic period, we have this big shift. So previously, all of the bookmaking that we've seen um, looking in, in Western Europe, uh, in the areas that are dominated by Christians, um, all the bookmark making is done in monasteries by monks in their scriptoria, right? Um, so there's a big shift during the Gothic period where we see urban workshops, so workshops within cities producing a lot of illuminated manuscripts. So it's not just monks anymore, and um, the urban workshops kind of overpass monks eventually in terms of their production. So we have a higher demand for books at this time, more people are literate, People are still largely illiterate, but more people are literate than, than previously. And books are predominantly stole, sold to the royal family, the royal families of different countries, um, scholars, and then also we have this developing merchant class. So because of the infrastructure of cities, we start seeing more people um, becoming wealthy from things like trade and things like banking and these kind of things who are not part of the royal family and are not part of the church, but are educated, are literate, and want to have things like books. So we see a greater demand. Um, and basically what these workshops are, these workshops that are in these cities, they're kind of the forerunners to publishing houses, okay? So one of the popular kinds of books that is being created a lot at this time in centers of publishing like Paris, are called moralized Bibles. Moralized Bibles are heavily, heavily illustrated. Um, the paintings are paired with uh, an explanation of the moral significance. So it's kind of like a picture book. So this is Genesis. This is God creating the world out of chaos. And there'll be like a picture to show you, because people are, are literate, but a lot of people still aren't. And then it's like, here's what's happening in picture form. And then there's a little written explanation out to the side. Okay, so let's look at this. This is um, an example of a page from a moralizing Bible. This is God is the creator of the world. Interesting thing here, we have God, um, which this is a story from the Old Testament. So this is before Jesus comes on the scene. But here he's depicted like Jesus is depicted and has a cruciform halo. Why? Well, because that's how he's easily identifiable to the populace. So they're like, oh, okay, I get it. This is the Christian God. This is Jesus. Okay, okay, okay. So, so it's to, to make it easier to understand. We can see that um, compared to some of the earlier illuminated manuscripts and illustrations we've seen from the Middle Ages, this one is more naturalized. It's not completely realistic, but a little more attention to what the body might be doing under that, uh, under the drapery instead of it being totally arbitrary. A little bit more naturalized features. We still have this gold background. I also really like that um, to illustrate what's happening, we have, okay, so we know which God this is. It's the Christian God, because we're depicting him as Jesus with his cruciform halo. What is he doing? Well, he's building something. He's building the earth out of the chaos of the cosmos. So let's have our chaos of the cosmos. How do we tell people he's building something? Well, here, we'll give him a tool for people who build buildings. So they give him a literal tool that like an architect would use so that people would understand symbolically what he is doing which is kind of awesome, actually. <laughs> so in these workshops, different people, um, different artists specialize in different specific things, okay? So you'll have one person who does all the underlying design and sketches, and then you'll have one person who goes in and paints all the temper paint, and you'll have one person who goes in and adds all the black line work after that. 
uh, kind of like someone who inks a comic book almost. And then you'll have another person who goes in and adds all the gilding, adds all the gold leaf. And then you'll have another guy who writes the stuff. So um, it's kind of like these little publishing house sort of factories of artists. And these are secular artists. These are not monks. So these are just people who are good at drawing or gilding or painting. Here's another example. So we can see some more stylistic changes here. We have the be another beginning of a re-interest in things like linear perspective, showing this architectural framework. Remember when we were talking about sculpture in the Gothic era and we looked at um, uh, the beautiful God sculpture and he had that little architectural framework above him? We start seeing that happening in the illuminated manuscripts as well. It's also really interesting because, um, so here we have David before Saul, so we have this um, depiction, it's a biblical story, um, but then we have all this stuff that has nothing to do with it. So we have like, there's a monkey here for some reason, there's a butterfly, there's a bird, there's a dragonfly. So we can see this is an artist kind of just showing off that they're good at things. Here's this very cute little snail in this, in this, um, kind of vining. We have a little bit of that interlaced patterning, so a little holdover from the early medieval, but just very, very stylized. And we start seeing the individual styles come through of these different artists who work in these workshops to um, create this work, which is kind of cool. <laughs> okay. Um, this I love. So there's uh, this artist, uh, Villard de Honecourt, um, and he's a famous artist of the time who does drawings for manuscripts, but he also does the drawings for um, masonry. So for like, you're building a cathedral and you need a lot of sculptures, this is a guy who will come in and design these sculptures for you. And one of the things that he does, and he teaches to these workshop people who are trying to figure out how to draw things effectively, is he shows them geometry, kind of the, the basic, how to break things down into basic shapes so that it makes it easier to draw things. So he has, this is just from one of his sketchbooks, and he kept extensive sketchbooks, so we can see sketches for sculptures and things that were actually created, like this. So you can see here sketches for these windows that were to be created, but you also just see things like this that are kind of random. Um, so he is famous for creating these kind of figures based on geometric shapes and helping educate other artisans, other people who are making work um, for these big workshops and things. So we see a big uptick in secular artists who, we saw this a little bit in the Romanesque, but it becomes even more prominent in the Gothic period. We were like, I know how to carve things out of stone. I'm very good at that. Or I know how to draw things really well. Or I know how to paint things really well. And so they start kind of flocking to these urban city centers where they can get work doing these kind of things. So people not affiliated with the church, but this is what they do for a living, and sometimes they move around Europe to get these type of jobs. All right, next we're going to look at England.